When I went to seminary, uh, the most interesting teachers I had were in Old Testament studies. I was very attracted to it, and uh, then when I went to graduate school at Union Seminary in New York, uh, I ran into more good teachers. My formative years of teaching were in the middle of uh, Vietnam and civil rights and Watergate and, and all of that, which, uh, you know, required us to try to do some heavy lifting about the Bible. I'm biased, but I think Old Testament teachers are probably in the theological curriculum, they're the best teachers because we got the best material. I'm uh, Walter Brigham. I'm a retired uh, teacher from Columbia Seminary in uh, Decatur, Georgia. Now I live in Cincinnati. Well, my father was a pastor, and uh, he uh, belonged to the generation of the social gospel. Uh, I went to uh, Eden Seminary in St. Louis, which historically has been a social gospel seminary. Uh, that's sort of its position and continues to be its position, uh, and that's how I learned theology. Uh, when I uh, finished um, seminary, I went to Union Seminary where uh, Reinhold Niebuhr's uh, influence was huge and uh, Reinhold Niebuhr comes out of the same pietistic tradition that I do so it was a kind of a natural thing. Like always Union Seminary was a, was a center of, uh, of great intellectual energy. Paul Tillich had left uh, by their retirement rule but he came back to do lectures and uh, it, was, it was just a hugely uh, uh, engaged place. And uh, my primary teacher uh, was James Meilenberg in Old Testament under whom I did my uh, thesis. And uh, he taught me uh, uh, rhetorical analysis, how to read the text in a way that, that appreciated the artistry of, uh, of the way the text functions and, and all of that. And, and I had uh, uh, really good uh, colleagues there. Uh, Phyllis Tribble uh, was uh, my uh, uh, close classmate for a lot of uh, seminars. Uh, I uh, was there soon after uh, uh, Norman Gottwald and uh, uh, Walter Harrelson. Uh, probably Norman Gottwald uh, has been the most important uh, American Old Testament scholar of the last generation uh, and what his work really did was to lead us to think economically uh, about the text. Uh, it turned out that uh, the most important uh, Old Testament scholar for me was Gerhard von Rod, uh, a, a great German scholar who in his day had withstood national socialism uh, in Germany uh, and uh, and in his own way bore witness to the radicality of the gospel. Uh, so I think I can identify that, that whole string of teachers for me that, that were all headed uh, in the same trajectory. And uh, that's where I put my buckets down very early and, uh, and continue to work from that, that angle of vision. So all of this uh, was very much in the, in the air uh, when I went to uh, Union, uh, they were still uh, working the uh, East Harlem Protestant Parish in which uh, students were regularly engaged in ministries in uh, disadvantaged communities in Harlem. Uh, and uh, uh, Union Seminary has always uh, and continues to be at the forefront of uh, whatever new liberation accents are uh, coming at us. And uh, it was it was just a it was just an incredible environment uh, to work in. I can identify three things that um, propel me. Uh, one is that the Old Testament text uh, is inexhaustibly significant and interesting. Uh, 
and uh, I am always surprised when I do fresh work. The second reason is that I am uh, uh, an ordained pastor and I work for the church and I do my uh, scholarship for the sake of the church. And the third reason is that I am uh, uh, vexed as many of us are about the situation of our society and uh, I believe that there are uh, important resources in the Old Testament uh, that will help us to uh, respond to the sorry situation that we are in. And uh, those three things of text and uh, ministry and uh, social responsibility uh, regularly converge for me. I think that the, uh, un, the, the tacit dominant narrative uh, of our society uh, is um, about military consumerism. It is uh, propelled by greed and anxiety and violence, and that narrative is a lie. It cannot produce life. Uh, so that I would say my, um, my scholarly work is an attempt to bear witness to an alternative meta-narrative uh, that is based in God's holiness and neighborliness, uh, and that when uh, social power and social resources are administered in a neighborly way, uh, it produces a just and peaceable society. Uh, so uh, I, uh, my mind works, I, I think this is sort of faithful to Niebuhr. My mind works uh, in terms of these profound tensions which we have to contest. And uh, that contestation, uh, as I understand it, is between the dominant narrative which cannot produce life and the alternative narrative of the gospel uh, which is a promise of life through neighborly vulnerability. Uh, and I think in uh, as many ways as I've been able to imagine, uh, I've been trying to uh, elucidate that tension. In my uh, Old Testament theology book, I talked about uh, testimony and counter-testimony. And so it's always this, uh, this tension uh, that we have to negotiate uh, that interests me always about uh, doing exegesis. I just uh, finished uh, a, a manuscript uh, on uh, money and uh, possessions in the Bible, and uh, uh, the sort of general conclusion I came to is that the Bible always lives in an economy of extraction, by which I mean that wealth is extracted from poor people, vulnerable people, and is transferred to powerful people and that the Bible in both the Old and the New Testament uh, intends to resist uh, an economy of extraction and intends to propose a practice of another way. So I think that's what I found in the text and uh, I think that's the overarching public problem now in the United States uh, that we live in an economy of extraction in which uh, wealth is being extracted uh, from vulnerable people by uh, cheap labor rates, by high interest rates, uh, by inordinate taxes on uh, people with lesser resources. So the, uh, in the management of debt uh, through credit cards, so the whole ball of wax uh, is uh, making vulnerable people more vulnerable. So we talk about the disappearance of the middle class that is a result of systemic extraction. Uh, and it seems to me that the, the biblical interpretation and the work of the church uh, is to resist that uh, extractive economy. I, I think so much of this is hooked into a, an uncritical notion of American exceptionalism uh, in which we imagine that we are God's people and we get our nationalism all confused with our Christian faith and uh, therefore uh, America's enemies are the enemies of God and the enemies of the gospel and all of that.
uh, when it seems to me that uh, what we have to recognize is that uh, Islam, like Christianity and like Judaism, we all have our nuts. And uh, uh, the nuts are very powerful now in all three traditions and uh, uh, our, our uh, incredible anxiety about these matters is totally disproportionate uh, to the reality of the facts on the ground. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we confuse uh, uh, America being God's chosen people with uh, uh, the whole national security state and all of that. Uh, and, and I think the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament is profoundly uh, critical and subversive of, uh, of those kinds of idolatries. So I think we are, uh, I think we are thick into idolatry uh, and uh, uh, our fear, I believe, is because we are trying to protect and save um, something that is quite can ultimate and should not be invested with that kind of ultimate importance. Uh, so I think we have huge witnessing and teaching to do uh, to the contrary. Uh, and I think what has happened is that, that, that we think that, that our safety is in the American military system or the American economic system uh, when in fact uh, uh, Christians faith is invested in the truth of God and the truth of the gospel, and we've got that all confused and, uh, and for the most part, do not want to sort it out. Yes, it's a, it's a collection of essays that uh, have been published in uh, random places, and I am so glad that the press uh, decided to bring them together. The, uh, the uh, lead essay um, uh, entitled The God of All Flesh uh, was written in honor of my uh, friend uh, Terry Fretheim who uh, just retired from Luther Seminary and uh, what I did was simply study the, the phrase all flesh uh, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, I suppose the, the place where we know all flesh the best uh, is in uh, at the end of the flood story in Genesis, where God makes a covenant with all flesh, meaning all human creatures and all non-human creatures. Uh, so the phrase uh, bespeaks God's uh, largest, most expansive fidelity to creation. And uh, I think there were four or five uses of the phrase in Jeremiah, so uh, then I uh, studied that. and. Uh, in that collection, uh, there is an essay that I wrote in honor of uh, Bernard Anderson, a very distinguished uh, Old Testament scholar, on, uh, on uh, imagination uh, as a mode of fidelity. And uh, much of my scholarly work uh, has been trying to uh, see how it is that uh, treating text with great uh, freedom and imagination is a legitimate way uh, to read texts, and uh, uh, that always lives in tension with our historical critical modes of interpretation uh, that want to be scientific and objective and not allow for any interpretive maneuvers, though uh, under the guise of objectivity we're always doing imagination anyway. Uh, and I think uh, I've contributed to the awareness in uh, biblical studies that, that uh, in order to be faithful interpreters of the text, uh, we really need to be quite imaginative about how we connect the old text to contemporary uh, life and uh, faith. Uh, so it's a series of, uh, of quite independent studies, uh, and there isn't really a, a common theme, uh, except that all of them uh, keep recurring in, in my scholarship over a good many decades now. I think that uh, dominant speech, that is the, the, the ruling class, uh, tends to speak in prose. Uh, 
for which the model I use is a memo. A, a good memo is always unambiguous. It, it directs what's supposed to happen. And I think that it's people who uh, want to subvert dominant reason or enlightenment reason who have to find another mode of speech uh, that does not lend itself to such control. So what I have been interested in for quite a while is the interface between memo and poem. And memo yields certitude and poetry subverts certitude and, and creates openness. And I think you can see that clash uh, going on very well in, in the Bible itself. I think in the, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus' parables are not quite poetry, but they are something like poetry in which they explore images that you can't quite chap, uh, uh, capture and flatten out. So I think that whole practice through the Bible is really a quite subversive enterprise that wants to subvert certitudes and the power of domination. And, and so I think uh, in our own time, black preaching uh, has been exactly that kind of subversive activity uh, in which uh, good black preachers are enormously imaginative uh, in ways that uh, churches of the ruling class uh, tend not to be. And I think that's a contest uh, that is always going on. So I take it as a part of my uh, uh, responsibility is to try to legitimate and evoke uh, that sort of subversive speech uh, that wants to call into question all of our settled certitudes. Very many people come to church wanting another package of certitudes. And uh, uh, I believe that the gospel isn't a package of certitudes. Uh, it's an invitation uh, to move into God's future, which is uh, not settled yet. Uh, uh, so my image is, when we think about church music and church singing, uh, it, all, it is all an artistic enterprise, uh, but we have uh, reduced it or disguised it uh, so we think that what we gather for is to recite the certitudes, when in fact what we gather for is exactly the opposite of that. The other thing that's been so important to me is the, the uh, awareness that, that uh, prophetic speech basically is poetic speech, uh, and uh, they are not, uh, uh, the prophets are not uh, uh, programmatic advocates for something, but rather they use all kinds of uh, strange metaphors and images in the most imaginative ways to open up the world to the rule of God. The same thing happens when New Testament writers use Old Testament texts and they handle them very imaginatively so it turns out to be something quite different and quite fresh and quite surprising. And uh, I think that, that our own interpretation uh, at its best replicates the stuff you can see going on in the Bible.